Okay, so welcome back. Um, let's see if we have any results from colleagues who may have looked at whether their topic has been previously evaluated through a search. Is there anybody who would like to make a comment about their topic? Mitya, are you there in the group? Are you, and uh, are you able to say anything about whether other studies exist on your topic? Okay, so I think, uh, right. So, uh, so are you able to unmute your mic microphone and just uh, sh share it, share the information that you are currently typing? Well, I, I did already some research on this subject and uh, what I found out is that there are some studies, there are some classification systems that were already developed, but uh, no system uh, used uh, like something for the evaluation that is objective and it's, uh, uh, it's not subjective in any way. And uh, it's like... Uh, the artificial intelligence uh, part would be about that. Okay. So if your question is about do systems for assessing outcome of breast reconstructions exist, the answer to that question is yes, that is correct. No? There are systems to evaluate it, but I, I found nothing about uh, using... Uh, this kind of system to evaluate it in an in a repeatable and objective way okay so is this something you think you are able to review and present your search and construct a figure one and at the end it may be possible for you to evaluate those studies that exist demonstrating that their quality is not good enough or they are not suitable well i i would say that i i most likely i'll be in the in that category that there are no studies that are exactly like that the studies are different they uh, developed a system to classify the breast reconstruction but they never did something that uh, used that uh, in in a different way so i would say that they have nothing that's really like that they are similar but uh, not exactly like uh, what i want to do but obviously i have to do okay. some more research to to be sure that there's nothing because i only okay. did the search on so, pubmed and so okay uh thank you very much uh that's very helpful now, you know that artificial intelligence is not just usable 
for creating these assessment systems like you are interested in. Artificial can, intelligence can also be used for systematic reviews. Did you ever hear about that? No. Okay. So here are some findings from a published paper. Uh, you will notice that I am a co-author on this with other colleagues, including some from um, artificial intel uh, of a computer sciences department. And at the current time, around five people working on a systematic review funded take about 12 months to complete the project. I'm not talking about a review carried out for a doctoral thesis. I'm talking about a substantial review undertaken in order to inform uh, uh, practice and policy uh, with respect to health service. But artificial intelligence software can be developed to automate the literature search aspect that I just described to you. and can also be developed to extract data from papers. And the idea is that few people can do the same stuff that normally is done by a lot of people over a long period of time, and that these two people can do it more quickly. So, for I, I noticed another colleague who was also mentioning artificial intelligence yesterday. I just want you to realize that artificial intelligence is not in itself something new or intellectually advanced. Artificial intelligence is something that simply automates what human beings do more slowly. And for this type of automation, um, to take place, in fact, it is necessary for the computer to know what human beings did beforehand which they did slowly. So when you say that your systematic review found nothing using artificial intelligence, I can accept that. But what I cannot accept is that you can have an artificial intelligence system that is doing something totally new because artificial intelligence normally does not do anything new. It only does things faster. Mitya, you, you have a question on the chat. You say the current standard is for five people working full-time on one review. Yes, that is correct. This is, a, this is a professionally carried out review that is used by, for example, the health ministry to create uh, practice and policy guidelines. You, you thought review is something that one could just do over a weekend, Mitya? No, obviously not. But uh, the way I think I will be using artificial intelligence is just as a tool. It's not that the artificial intelligence is doing something, but using it as a tool, it has never been described before in, yeah, this, I, I, uh, yes. in this way. Yeah. So what I meant to say was that you said the studies exist before that created some uh, rules or formula or but never applied it by artificial intelligence. In fact, reviewing those formulas, um, criteria, et cetera, will itself be extremely worthwhile. If they have not been subjected to a systematic review before. I think that there are very few of them. So I don't know if it's enough for a uh... <laughs> really good systematic review. It's uh, more of a comparison of a couple of systems. Well, I only remind you that 20 years ago, BMJ published a review 
with zero studies. And I, I don't think I need to say anything more than that. And, okay, any other colleague who wants to bring forward his example for consideration or discussion? Okay, if not, I like to say a few words at this stage about something called publication bias. Have you heard about publication bias? May, may I ask if you've heard about publication bias? Yes, okay. Eva says yes. Nesa says yes, Ochka says yeah, says no. So Eva or Nesa, are you able to explain to Hoshka and the rest of us, what have you heard about publication bias? Uh, maybe um, the good research outcome is uh, published more likely than a negative one. Okay. So if you do a good study, if you do a study and its result is positive, Is there anybody else who would like to say something about publication bias? Okay, no, no problem, Nessa. Uh, anybody else would like to, e Eva, would you like to say something more about uh, this issue? Uh, I can explain as I understand. Yeah, please do, thank you. Um, if I'm not wrong, um, the publication bias uh, refers to um, the probability of uh, studies with positive findings um, so that the studies with uh, positive findings uh, are more likely to be published than those uh, uh, which did not um, find uh, statistic significant differences, for example. And that's uh, called publication bias. So if you only include um, the published studies into a systematic review, you are um, risking um, this uh, type of bias. So you automatically make a conclusion that uh, one intervention is, for example, uh, good or better than the other, according to the published studies. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Evo makes a comment that you made a good explanation. So I appreciate that. How do you think publication bias can affect your searches? And is there anything you can do to evaluate whether there is publication bias or not inside your search for a systematic review? Okay, so this is what I would like to cover in this session. Uh, the first thing you need to understand, and I hope many of you do, is how are the results calculated 
when a, after a study is completed. So we take the example of a standard trial uh, where the sample is first allocated to intervention or control, and then people are followed up to see whether they have outcome or they don't have outcome. And from this information, an effect size is calculated. So what has been said by colleagues just a moment ago is that if the effect size is positive, then such a study is more likely to be published. And such a study is therefore more likely to be included in the systematic review. And also, if we end up having only positive studies in the systematic reviews that are selectively published, the review can erroneously conclude that there is a positive effect. So taking this idea further, first we need to understand how is the effect size calculated. There are many ways to do it, but we'll take the example of what is known as a two by two table. So we'll just follow through an example of a study of 200 subjects, 100 of whom have been allocated each to control or intervention. You know that in any study there is patient loss or data loss, but for the purpose of our teaching and learning, come happened to be whether you became pregnant or not. And uh, is there, is there, is there... Okay. I'm quite happy to repeat if, uh, if, if I haven't been followed through completely. So you can imagine it, that in the control group, 10 people had the outcome of interest which was becoming pregnant uh, because these 200 people who are included in the study suffered from infertility. And then in the intervention group, 25 people became pregnant. And from this information, how can we calculate the effect size? This is something I'm going to show you next. So, what we need to do is from this flow chart, construct what is called a two by two table. So we include the outcome at the top of this table. So outcome is either present or absent. So under intervention, outcome is present or absent. And under control, outcome is present or absent. So you can see that the number 25, which is the number of people in the intervention group who became pregnant or had the outcome, goes in cell A. The total goes at the end of this uh, row. Equally, 10 who became pregnant in the control group, this number goes in cell C and the total goes at the end of the row. And from this information, we got to calculate the effect size. I just want to be sure that what I have described so far has been picked up by all colleagues in this uh, webinar. Can any one of you confirm uh, by entering the chat to say whether or not you did not follow what I have explained so far. Okay, thank you, you for confirming that so far it's going well. All right, so we now understand how the two by two table is to be constructed. The question is how from this information we can calculate effect size. So remember we have participants, intervention, exposure, outcome, and design. 
Well, the two by two table is in fact a representation of your question in a simple way where numbers can be presented. So basically the total of the numbers in the two groups is the total of your participants in the study. And you already know what the intervention is, which is the top row and the comparison, which is the bottom row and the outcome, which is the first column and the absence of the outcome, which is the second column. So can, can you now see all the time we spent yesterday understanding how to structure the question is put together in a simple two by two table. And now we populate this hypothetical table with numbers. And here we are, we've got 25 and 10 and a hundred and a hundred. And one of the effect size calculation considers what is known as risk or proportion. So the risk of becoming pregnant or the proportion of people who became pregnant in the intervention group is 25 divided by 100. So this is 0 0.25. The control group, the same information is 0 0.1 or 10%. And the effect called relative risk is the division of the risk in the intervention group by the risk in the control group and this value is 2.5. So I'm going to stop here one more time and ask colleagues if this information has been understood. Kitadej confirms that uh, it is understood. Thank you. Okay, have you heard of any other measure of effect size? Would anybody like to write it down in the chat or say it by unmuting your microphone? So absolute risk is uh, mentioned by Esther. So absolute risk, I guess what you mean is absolute risk reduction. So absolute risk reduction is basically risk difference. It is 0 0.25 subtracted by 0 0.1, which leaves you 0 0.15. So using the same two by two table and using information calculated for risk, it's easily possible to calculate relative, uh, sorry, absolute risk reduction. Another word for absolute risk reduction, another term for absolute risk reduction is risk difference, which is much more clear in terms of what do you need to do in the two by two table in order to get to that number, which is the difference of the two risks. So risk difference is absolute risk reduction. Any other, any other effect size measures you have come across? Okay, so we have a couple of uh, comments in the chat. Let me just have a look at what these are. So you mentioned odds ratio, two of you. Thank you for bringing that up. So I'm going to show you calculation of odds ratio. So for calculating risk, we only needed to know the information about number of outcome and the total number in the group. In odds, we need to know a third piece of information, which is the number without the outcome. So the odds in intervention is 
25 divided by 75. So you can see this is different from risk in the intervention group. The odds in the control are the outcome divided by those without the outcome. So 10 divided by nine. And then the odds ratio is the division of odds in the intervention by odds in the control. And this value is 3.0. So I'll take a pause here and again ask if the odds ratio calculation has been understood. Okay, thank you. One of uh, the colleagues in the group says yes. Is there anybody who hasn't understood? Okay, uh, I, I'm gonna move on. The odds ratio that I just calculated, I can just go back to the previous slide to remind you that this number was calculated using exactly the same data as that which was used to calculate the relative risk. So I want you to understand here that the odds, the effect size chosen determines the effect size obtained. So the number 2.5 is smaller than the number 3.0. For somebody who does not understand that the same data can produce different effects, may think that the odds ratio of three shows that the treatment is more effective than the relative risk of 2.5. That makes sense. May I ask any colleague to make any comment about what I just said? Gasper or Ted Chair, you, okay, you want me to repeat the question. My, my question is, if I was to present you 2.5 as the effect of intervention, or if I was to present you 3.0 as the effect of intervention, the chances are that you might think that 3.0 is more effective than 2.5. However, the point I would like you to pick up here is that this number is 2.5 because the effect measure is relative risk. This number is 3.0 because the effect measure is odds ratio. And these two numbers, emerge from the same two by two table. So the treatment is not more effective because the number is 3.0 and it is greater than the number 2.5. Okay, I, I, I'm sorry if I'm insisting on asking you this question again. I'd just like you to know that, uh, I'd like myself to know that you have understood that the choice of effect measure influences the number we obtained for effect size. And is somebody able to make a comment about what I just said? Eva, you said you were not clear. Could I repeat? I have repeated and have you now understood? Okay, Tadeja says that you have understood. Thank you for confirming that. Eva, you too uh, say you've understood. All right. Now, Evo says you understand the numbers, 
but I've had time to appreciate the difference between risk and odds. Well, if you are not the only one, uh, the majority of the people fail to understand what odds ratio means. They fail to realize that I, if I was saying, apologies, if you could not hear me, uh, you point out. What I wanted to highlight was that uh, you are not the only one who is confused. Uh, the majority of people who read papers are confused about the difference between relative risk and odds ratio. Ivo, did you pick up what I now explained? Okay, Eva, you do confirm. Uh, thank you. All right, so I'd like to move on. I'd like to highlight the estimate this is the is the product of um, the total number of people who are inside the sample size. Okay, Kati, I'm sorry that I'm uh, breaking off and Evo, you are also having a hard time hearing me. Please bear with me. I hope you will pick up that once the point estimate is calculated for odds ratio, the next thing we need to do is calculate the range of results possible given the sample size. And this is captured by the confidence interval. And just to be consistent with what we uh, presented in the calculation before, I'm just going to readjust this diagram for you so you are able to see what I'm talking about. So here is, let's say, the odds ratio and point estimate of three approximately that we calculated. If there were a bigger study around, the confidence interval in such a bigger study could be small, right? So here is, let's say, a bigger study. Here you can see that the confidence interval is smaller. And here are some smaller studies with bigger confidence intervals that even show a result opposite to the small study. So now if we return to this figure, you can see confidence interval, you can see smaller studies. These likely smaller studies are likely to be missing simply because the result is opposite possibly to the result of a big study which has a smaller confidence interval in the same area of the subject. 
this idea that smaller studies could be missing is captured by something called funnel plot. So funnel plot has study size plotted on one side, effect size plotted on the other side, and in a well carried out search, the larger studies will be spread in the center of the spread of the smaller studies, which will be all over the place. So if this makes sense to you, the next thing is to imagine a search where the results produced have the larger studies on one side and all the smaller studies together on the other side. And this part of the distribution is missing. These type of missing results are possibly the result of what is called publication bias. So at this stage, I would like to stop and ask if colleagues have any questions. So Evo says you, the graphical demonstration was reasonable or good. Thank you. Um, anybody else has comment or question about what I just uh, described? Esther, you say you have no question. So I presume you have understood that construction of a graph where the effect size that I demo usually that measure is inverse of variance, um, then it is possible to have a hunch about whether publication bias has affected your search. And you can even perform statistical tests to check whether there is a significant uh, possibility of missing studies beyond chance. Um, and one of those tests, for example, is called Eggers test. Uh, so to summarize, you carry out a search as comprehensively as possible, and then you attempt to examine whether your search is affected by publication bias by making a plot of effect size against a measure of sample size. So with this, I bring this second session to an end, and uh, we'll see you back in about 20 minutes.